Book Two, Chapter One of Strangers and Pilgrims. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. Strangers and Pilgrims by Mary Elizabeth Braden. Book Two, Chapter One. Two souls, alas, dwell in my breast. The one struggles to separate itself from the other. The one clings with obstinate fondness to the world, with organs like cramps of steel. The other lifts itself majestically from the mist to the realms of an exalted ancestry. A sunny afternoon in the second week of May, one of those brilliant spring days which cheat the dweller in cities who has no indications of the year's progress around and about him no fields of newly sprouting corn or hedges where the blackthorn shows silvery white above grassy banks dappled with violets and primroses into the belief that summer is at hand the citizen has no succession of field birds to serve for his timekeepers but he hears canaries and piping bullfinches caroling in balconies perhaps sees a flower girl at a street corner and begins to think he is in the month of roses it seemed the month of roses in one small drawing-room in eden place south a back drawing-room and of the tiniest with a fernery of dark green grass artfully contrived to shed a dim religious light upon the chamber and at the same time mask the view of an adjacent mews the daintiest possible thing in the way of back drawing-rooms furnished with chairs and dwarf couches of the poof species covered with cream-colored cretonne and befrilled muslin a coffee table or two in convenient corners the clock on the maroon velvet covered mantelpiece a chubby cupid in turquoise sevre beating a drum the candelabra two other chubby blue bantlings struggling under their burden of wax candles curtains of maroon velvet and old flemish lace half screening the fire in the low steel grate ensconced in the most luxurious of the poofs with her feet on the tapestried fender stool a joint labor of the four latrell girls and a large green fan between her face and the glow sat elizabeth latrell she was not alone aunt chevigny was writing letters at her davenport in the front drawing-room the swift flight of her quill pen might be heard ever and anon in the rearward chamber and reginald paulin was sitting a cheval upon a smaller poof rocking himself to and fro to the endangerment of the casters as he discoursed come now i want you to like mrs Sinkmars." he said in an argumentative tone she may not be quite what you'd call good style i know very little of good or bad style interrupted elizabeth in a somewhat contemptuous tone your world is so new to me but certainly mrs Sinkmars has hardly what that french secretary of legation i went into dinner with the other night called l'air du faubourg well no perhaps not dresses a little too much and indulges rather too freely in slang perhaps but she's the most kind-hearted creature in the world gives the best parties out not your high and mighty nine o'clock dinners with cabinet ministers and ambassadors and foreign princelings and so forth but carpet dances and acting charades and impromptu suppers and water parties you go to her house to amuse yourself in short and not to do the civil to a lot of elderly fogies with orders at their buttonholes or to talk politics with some heavy swell whose name is always cropping up in the times leaders who is mr st mars inquired elizabeth with a supercilious air henri du chatelet de st mars born a belgian of a french canadian father and an english mother that's his nationality made his money upon various stock exchanges and continues so to make it only extending his operations now and then by buying up a steamboat line 
or something in that way a man who will burst up some of these days no doubt and pay ninepence or so in the pound but in the meantime he lives very decently at the rate of twenty thousand a year he has literary proclivities too and is editor and proprietor of the ring a weekly paper in the sporting and theatrical interests with a mild flavor of the age and the satirist which you may or may not have seen i never look at newspapers said elizabeth but pray why are you so anxious that i should like your mrs du chatelet de cinq mars she asked lowering her fan and gratifying the viscount with an inquiring gaze from her brilliant eyes more than ever brilliant since she had drunk the sparkling cup of london pleasures because she's the nicest person you could possibly have for a chaperon ah of course i know answering her glance in the direction of the busy letter writer whose substantial form was visible in the distance your aunt is a plucky old party and can stand a good deal of knocking about for a veteran but i think she'd knock under if she tried mrs sinkmar's work that blessed little woman shows up at every race in great britain from pontefract to the Curra, and at every regatta and in the autumn you find her at homburg or baden gambling like old boots now if you would only put yourself under her wing concluded lord paulyn persuasively you'd stand some chance of seeing life thank you very much but i think i've seen enough in the last five weeks to last me for the remainder of my existence mrs Sinkmars is a most good-natured person no doubt she called me my dear half an hour after i'd been introduced to her and i won't be so rude as to say that she's not good style but she's not my style and i shouldn't care about knowing her more intimately besides papa wants me at home and i'm really anxious to go back she smiled to herself with a pensive smile thinking what reason she had for this anxiety thinking of the quiet country town the grey old norman church with its wide aisles and ponderous square tower the church along whose bare arched roof malcolm ford's deep voice echoed resonantly thinking of that widely different life with its sluggish calm and that it would be very sweet to go back to it now that life at holly meant happy triumphant love and malcolm for her bond slave but in the meantime this other and more mundane existence with its picture galleries and gardens botanical and horticultural putting forth their first floral efforts its dinners and dejeuner and kettle drums and carpet dances was something more than tolerable to the soul of elizabeth she had made a success in her aunt's circle which was by no means a narrow one and had received adulation enough to turn a stronger brain had found a cup of pleasure filled to overflowing and new worshippers everywhere she appeared had mrs chevenny been a step or two higher on the nicely graduated platform of society miss luttrell might have been the belle of the season as it was people talked of her as the beautiful miss luttrell a country clergyman's daughter a mere nobody but a nobody whom it was a solecism not to have met she accepted this homage with an air of calm indifference something bordering even upon arrogance or superciliousness which told well for her but in her secret soul she absorbed the praises of mankind greedily she showed herself an adept in the art of flirtation and had given so much apparent encouragement to lord paulyn that although she had been only five weeks in town her engagement to that young nobleman was already an established fact in the minds of people who had seen them together but she was not the less constant to her absent lover not the less eager for his brief but earnest letters she looked forward to her future without a pang of regret with rapturous anticipation rather of a little heaven upon earth with the man she adored but she thought at the same time that her chosen husband 
was a peculiarly privileged being and that he had need to rejoice with a measureless joy in having won so rare a prize if he could see the attention i receive here he might think it almost strange that i should love him better than all the rest of the world she said to herself going back to hawley cried lord paul in a ghast why you mustn't dream of such a thing till after the good wood week i've set my heart on showing you good wood what is good wood asked elizabeth thinking it might be some new kind of game an improvement upon croquet perhaps and when is the good wood week towards the end of july in july that would never do i must go home in a fortnight at the latest why your aunt told me you were coming up for the season my aunt has no right to say anything of the kind oh but it's positively absurd exclaimed the viscount going back just when there'll be most people in town and such a dingy old hole as hawley what possible necessity can there be for your returning mr luttrell has your three sisters to take care of him he'll do well enough i should think oh yes i dare say he will get along very well said elizabeth thinking of another person who had written lately to inquire rather seriously whether the few weeks were not nearly over whether she had not had ample time already for a brief survey of a world whose pomps and vanities she was going to renounce for ever only thereby conforming to the pious promises of her godfathers and godmothers which her own lips had ratified at her confirmation come now said lord paulyn returning to the charge do let me arrange an alliance between you and mrs cinqmars she's just the kind of person with whom you could enjoy yourself she has a box on the grand stand at epsom and ascot every year i shouldn't wonder if she had bought the freehold of them and always takes a brace of pretty girls with her if you would only let her drive you down to the derby now to-morrow week i'll be responsible for your having a delightful day and i'll be in attendance to show you everything and everybody worth seeing thanks i don't think my aunt cares for mrs cinqmars your aunt is about a century behind the times but perhaps flora mrs c hasn't been civil enough to her let me drive you and mrs chevenix down to fulham this afternoon tuesday's her day for receiving and you'll see no end of nice people there i'll send my groom for the drag and take you through the park in good style a four in hand seemed to elizabeth the glory and triumph of the age and there was nothing particular in the easton place programme for this afternoon i shall like it very well she said brightening if auntie would consent oh i'll soon settle that replied lord paulyn rising from his poof and going into the next room mrs chevenix after a little diplomatic hesitation consented to everything except the drag no young lady with a proper regard for her reputation can ride on the box seat of a four in hand unless the coachman is her brother or her husband i'm very glad i'm not the first in this case said lord paulyn and i certainly mean to be the second if i can these were the plainest words the viscount had yet spoken and they moved the spirit of aunt chevenix with exceeding joy albeit she knew that her niece was engaged to mr ford if you really wish us to visit mrs cinqmars and you know dear lord paulyn there is very little i would not do to oblige you she said with a maternal air i'll take lizzie down to the rancho in the brougham and you can join us there if you like mrs cinqmars has called upon me several times and i have not returned her visits she seems a very good-natured little person but you see i'm getting an old woman and i don't care much about cultivating new acquaintance thus mrs chevenix who had run herself into a fever in the pursuit of an unknown countess lord paulyn waved the question of the drag regretfully my horses haven't been as fit as they are to-day since they came from grass 
he said but i'll drive down alone what time will you start it's just four mrs cinqmars is always in full force from five to six if you'll be kind enough to ring the bell i'll order the carriage for a quarter to five i shall have time to dress after i've finished my letters for the general post can't think how any one can write letters now we've got the telegraph said lord paulyn staring in amazement at aunt chevenix's bulky dispatches i always wire but if you were in love and separated from the object of your affection suggested mrs chevenix smiling i should wire or if i had something uncommonly spoony to say i might spell it backwards in the second column of the times i don't know how to write a letter indeed i'm not at all clear that i haven't forgotten how to write longhand altogether i keep my betting book in cipher and when i send a telegram i always dictate the message to the post office clerk but i should have thought now with respect to your racehorses the telegraph system might be dangerous there are things you want to keep dark as you call it are there not of course there are but we've got our code my trainer and i and use private names for every brute in my stable got a message this morning bryant and may taken to the bassoon by which i know that vesuvian a two-year-old i was backing for next year has been run out of her wind in some confounded trial and is musical musical yes ma'am a roarer if you want it in plain english dear me how provoking said mrs chevenix with a sympathetic countenance but with not the faintest idea what the viscount meant elizabeth consented to the rancho business languidly i'd rather stay at home and finish my novel she said looking at an open novel lying on one of the poofs you can't imagine what an exciting chapter you interrupted lord paulyn but of course i shall go if auntie likes auntie has such an insatiable appetite for society mrs chevenix raised her eyebrows and regarded her niece with admiring wonder who would ever imagine the child had been reared in a devonshire vicarage she exclaimed as elizabeth sat fanning herself an image of listless grace who would have supposed venus came out of the sea replied the viscount she didn't look weedy or sandy or shellfishy that ever i heard of but came up smiling with her hair combed out as neatly as the tails and manes of my fillies and as to rustic bringing up there was that young woman in the play lady teasel you know see how she carried on the viscount departed after this happy in the prospect of meeting elizabeth an hour later in the happy hunting grounds of the rancho perhaps the best field for flirtation within three miles of hyde park corner elizabeth exclaimed mrs chevenix when they were alone with an air of almost awful solemnity there is a coronet lying at your feet if you have only the wisdom to pick it up i am not going to make any complaint or to express my opinions or to say anything in disparagement of that person i've kept my feelings upon that subject locked within my breast at any cost of pain to myself but if when you have looked around you and seen what the world is made of you can be so infatuated as to persist in your mad course i can only pity you don't take the trouble to do that auntie i can imagine no higher happiness than that which i have chosen a coronet is a grand thing of course with all the other things that go along with it i am not going to pretend that i don't care for the world and its pleasures i do care for them i have enjoyed my life in the last three weeks more than i thought it possible that life could be enjoyed i fear that i have an infinite capacity for frivolity 
and yet i shall be proud to surrender all these things for the love of the man i have chosen the man you have chosen repeated mrs chevenix with a shiver my dearest lizzie is there not a shade of indelicacy in the very phrase i can't help that answered elizabeth coolly i know that i did choose him i chose him from all creation for the lord of my life worshipped him in secret when i thought he was indifferent to me should have died of a broken heart i believe or at any rate of mortification and disappointment if he had never returned my love this was a bold declaration intended to extinguish aunt chevenix at once and for ever my poor child said the matron shaking her head with a deploring air i am inexpressibly grieved to hear you speak in that wild manner of such a person as your father's curate a man in that position cannot afford to be loved in that exaggerated way a grand passion is out of keeping among people with limited incomes and their career to make in the world with people of established position it is different of course and though i might smile at such an infatuation were you to entertain it for lord paulyn i could hardly disapprove you and he would be as far removed from the vulgar herd of engaged persons as a prince and princess in a fairy tale and might safely indulge in some little extravagance you need fear very little extravagance on my part if lord paulyn were my accepted lover answered elizabeth with a cynical laugh imagine any one mated to that prosaic being with his slang and his stable talk in spite of those small drawbacks which after all are natural to his youth and open-hearted disposition i believe him to be capable of a most devoted attachment i have seen him gaze at you elizabeth in a way that made my blood run cold when i considered that you were capable of trampling upon such a heart for the sake of a scotch curate however i will say nothing concluded mrs chevenix with heroism after having said all she wanted to say in half an hour the two ladies were dressed and on their way to fulham elizabeth enveloped in a fleecy cloud of whiteness with gleams of lustrous mauve here and there among her drapery and a mauve feather in her white chip hat gloves faultless parasol a gem a toilet whose finishing touches had been furnished by the well-filled purse of mrs chevenix the matron herself was resplendent in bronze silk and an imposing blue bonnet they had put on their richest armor for the encounter with mrs cinqmars a lady who spent her life in trying to dress down her acquaintance end of book two chapter one recording by john brandon book two chapter two of strangers and pilgrims this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. Strangers and Pilgrims by Mary Elizabeth Braden. Book Two, Chapter Two. Applause waits on success, the fickle multitude, like the light straw that floats along the stream, glide with the current still and follow fortune. Fulham is a neighborhood of infinite capabilities it is almost impossible to know the ultimate boundaries of a region to which nature seems to have hardly yet assigned any limit from squalid streets of six-roomed houses to splendid places surrounded by park-like grounds from cemeteries and market gardens bare expanses of asparagus or turnips where the atmosphere is rank with decaying garden stuffs to arenas reserved for the competition of the fleet-footed and strong-armed of our modern youth and to shady groves dedicated to the slaughter of the harmless pigeon from newly built red-brick mansions hiding themselves coyly within high walls 
and darkened by the shade of immemorial cedars fulham has stomach for them all queer little lanes still lead the explorer to unknown or at least to him unknown tracts of inland country and on that wild shore between the bridges of putney and hammersmith there are far-spreading gardens and green lawns which a worldly-minded person might long for as the paradise of his departed soul the rancho was one of these places by the river a house and grounds which after belonging to a titled owner had sunk to gradual decay under undistinguished and incapable tenants and at last coming into the market for a larger price than spectators were inclined to give had after hanging on hand for a long time been finally bought at dead bargain by mr singpars this gentleman being amply provided with funds whether his own or other people's was of course a minor question and being moreover blessed with a wife who had a taste set to work to remodel the house which was old and not capacious and altogether in that condition in which it is cheaper to pull down than to rebuild mr Sinkmars, however left the lower reception rooms which were fine almost untouched only widening the windows in the drawing-room to the whole width of the room and putting a glass roof to the billiard-room which could be replaced by an awning in warm weather or thrown open to the sky on starlit summer nights on each side of these central rooms he built a commodious wing in rustic woodwork after the model of a mexican farmhouse in which he had once spent a week during his travels all round the house he put a wooden veranda ten feet wide and paved with cool blue and cream-coloured tiles and having done this he furnished all the rooms in the purest rustic fashion with light woods pastoral chintzes scattered with violets and primroses no draperies to the windows which were amply shaded by venetian blinds within and spanish hoods without very few carpets but oak floors polished to distraction and indian matting in the passages it was a house that was built apparently for eternal summer but was yet so contrived as to be extremely comfortable when march winds were howling round the veranda or an april snowstorm drifting against the glass roof of the billiard room on a real summer's day it was distractingly delightful and to return from its light and airy chambers to the dingy square rooms of a london house a mere packing case set upon end in a row of other packing cases was not conducive to the preservation of a contented mind but mr and mrs Sinkmars were people who could not have lived in a house that was not better than everybody else's house they were people who lived upon their surroundings their surroundings were themselves as it were if anybody asked who mr Sinkmars was his friends and admirers plunged at once into a glowing description of the rancho or demanded with an air of amazement how it came to pass you had not seen his horses in the park high-stepping bays with brass mounted harness there was a place in scotland too which mr Sinkmars spoke of somewhat vaguely and which might be anything from half a county down to half a dozen acres he was in the habit of promising his acquaintances good shooting on that domain but in the hurry and pressure of modern life these promises are rarely fulfilled every man's autumn is mortgaged before the spring is over there is nothing safer than a liberal dealing out of general invitations in june or july mrs Sinkmars was at home every tuesday throughout the london season and to be at home with mrs Sinkmars meant a great deal the grounds of the rancho were simply perfect ancient gardens 
with broad lawns gently sloping to the water lawns whose deep and tender herbage had been cultivated for ages forest trees which shut out the world on every side except that noble curve of the river which made a shallow bay before the windows of the rancho cedars of lebanon spreading their dusky branches wide above the shadowy sward mrs cinqmars did not to any great extent affect gaudy flower-beds parallelograms of scarlet geranium and calcellaria silver-gray leafage and potting out plants of the pickling cabbage order or ribbon bordering are not these things common to all the world instead of these she had masses of rough stonework and young forests of fern in the shady corners of her grounds and a regiment of century-old orange trees in great green tubs ranged along a broad walk leading down to the river her grounds were shady realms of greenery rather than showy parterres she had had hothouses and forcing pits somewhere in the background and all her rooms were adorned to profusion with the choicest flowers but only in the rose season was there much display of color in the gardens of the rancho then indeed mrs cinqmars lawn was as some fertile valley in cashmere and the very atmosphere which mrs cinqmars inhaled was heavy with the odors of all the noblest and choicest families among the rose tribe arcades of roses roses climbing skyward upon iron rods temples that looked like gigantic bird cages overrun with roses roses everywhere for a brief season of glory and delight the season of fresh strawberry ices and mature but not overgrown whitebait on these her days mrs cinqmars kept open house from five o'clock upwards there was a great dinner later in the evening but by no means a formal banquet for the men who came in morning dress to lounge remained to dine mature matrons whose bonnets were as things immovable were permitted to dine in that kind of headgear there was a general air of bohemianism about the rancho billiards were played till the summer daylight the sound of cabs and phaetons dog-carts and single broughams startled the slumbering echoes in the fulham lanes between midnight and sunrise the goddess of pleasure was worshipped in a thorough-going unqualified manner as intense as the devotion which inspired human sacrifices on the shrine of the mooned astaroth in fine weather when the sun was bright and the air balmy and only occasional shivers reminded happy idlers that an english climate is treacherous mrs cinqmars delighted to receive her friends in the garden innumerable armchairs of foreign basket-work were to be found in snug little corners of the grounds tiny tables were ready for the accommodation of teacups or ice-plates champagne and claret-cup were as bounteously provided as if those beverages had been running streams watering the velvet lawns and meandering through the groves of the rancho wainham's clear ice was as plentiful as if the thames had been one solid block from thames to noor there was no croquet in this as in the flower beds mrs cinqmars had been forestalled by all the world but as a substitute for this universal recreation mrs cinqmars had imported all manner of curious games upon queer little tables with wiry mazes and bells and balls at which a good deal of money and still larger amount of manufacture of piver or jovan were lost and won on that lady's tuesdays the chatelaine herself even was not insensible to the offerings of gloves she had indeed an insatiable appetite for that commodity and absorbed so many packets of apricot and lavender treble buttons 
from her numerous admirers that it might be supposed that her husband while lavishing upon her every other luxury altogether denied her these emblems of civilization but as mrs cinqmars was never seen in a glove which appeared to have been worn more than half an hour it may be fairly imagined that her consumption of the article was large taking a moderate view of the case and supposing that she wore only three pairs per diem she would require more than a thousand pairs per annum and this last straw in the expenses of her sumptuous toilet may have broken mr cinqmars back however this might be mrs cinqmars was singularly successful in all these small games of chance tempered by skill and did a good deal of ladylike speculation upon various races into the bargain whereby the glove-boxes not paltry toys made to hold half a dozen or so but huge caskets of carved sandalwood with partitions for the divers colours were never empty young men were seen approaching her through the groves of the rancho armed with dainty oblong packages their humble tribute to the goddess of the grove tribute which she received with a business-like coolness as her due there were malicious people who hinted that mrs cinqmars was not inaccessible to larger offerings the diamond bracelets ruby crosses emerald earrings which were not the gifts of her husband had found their way to her jewel cases but as mr cinqmars was exorbitantly rich this was of course a fabrication only there is an order of goddesses somewhat insatiable in the matter of tribute goddesses who on being suddenly possessed of the koh-i-noor would that instant languish for the star of the south as a pendant thereto upon this particular afternoon in may the air was balmy and the sun unseasonably warm for it is only the fond believer in idyllic poets who expects genial weather in may and the grounds of the rancho were gay with visitors brightly costumed groups scattered here and there in the shade a perpetual crowd hovering about the footsteps of mrs cinqmars as she moved to and fro among her guests so delighted to see every one a cheerful chatter of many voices and a musical jingle of teaspoons mildly suggestive of refreshment mrs cinqmars was a little woman with intensely black eyes and long black hair hair which she wore down her back after the fashion of a horse's tail and which reached ever so far below her waist hair which she delighted to tie with brilliant coloured ribbons she was a woman who affected brilliant colours and as she flashed here and there amidst the greenery had something the air of a gorgeous paraquito from some far southern isle her hair and her eyes were her strong points and to come within the range of those tremendous orbs was like facing a battery of lancastrians they dealt ruin across the open country bringing down their quarry at terrific distance to be able to stand the blaze of mrs cinqmars eyes was to be case-hardened tried in the fire of a half a dozen london seasons for the rest she was hardly to be called a pretty woman her complexion was sallow and as she wished to have the freehold and not a short lease of whatever beauty she possessed she was wise enough to refrain from the famous arts of our modern medea madame rachel levison her small hands and feet coquettish costumes brilliant eyes and luxuriant hair she had considered all sufficient for the subjugation of mankind she received mrs chevenix and her niece with effusion so kind of them to come and so on and she really was glad to see them they belonged to a class which she was peculiarly desirous to cultivate the eminently respectable not that she for her own part liked this order of beings or would for worlds have had her parties composed of such alone but a little leaven might leaven the whole lump 
and mrs cinqmars was quite aware that the mass of her society did require such leavening not that mrs cinqmars was herself in any manner disreputable she had never been accused of carrying a flirtation beyond the limits which society has prescribed for a young matron she was known to be devoted to her husband and her husband's interests and yet the friends and flatterers she gathered around her were not the choicest fruit in the basket they were rather those ever so slightly speckled peaches which only fetch a secondary price in the market the class with which mr cinqmars shared the glories of his wealth and state was that class which seems by some natural affinity to ally itself with the wealthy parvenu second-rate authors newspaper men and painters fastish noblemen military men with a passion for amateur theatricals and so on tout la boutique as mrs cinqmars observed mr cinqmars had a two hundred ton yacht of notorious speed and sailing capacity which assisted him in the cultivation of youthful scions of the aristocracy whose presence imparted a grace to the dinner parties and kettle drums at the rancho but it happened unfortunately that the youthful scions were for the most part impecunious and did not materially advance du chatelet's interests it was not often that mr and mrs cinqmars were so fortunate as to cultivate such an acquaintance as lord paulyn and the friendship of that wealthy nobleman had been a source of much gratification to both husband and wife reginald paulyn liked the easy-going style of the rancho liked to feel himself a god in that peculiar circle liked to be able to flirt with agreeable young women who were not perpetually beneath the piercing eye of a calculating parent or guardian to flirt a little even in a strictly honourable manner with mrs cinqmars herself to play billiards till the summer stars grew pale or to gamble in moonlit groves where the little bells on the bewired and benumbered boards tinkled merrily under the silent night lord paulyn liked to enjoy himself without paying any tax in the shape of ceremony and the rancho offered him just this kind of enjoyment he too had his yacht the pixie so there was sympathy between him and the adventurous du chatelet who had crossed the atlantic in a half-decked pinnace of thirty tons and discovered the source of the nile for his own amusement before any of the more distinguished explorers who had made themselves known to fame according to his own account of his various and interesting career i like the rancho you know the viscount would remark to his friends in the condescending air it's like a little bit of hamburg on the banks of the thames and cinqmars isn't half a bad fellow a little loud of course you know and so is mrs c and one needn't believe a large percentage of what either of em says but i rather like that kind of thing one gets surfeited with good manners in the season to these happy hunting grounds the viscount was peculiarly desirous to introduce elizabeth it was all very well calling three or four times a week in eaton place and whiling away a couple of hours under the eye or within reach of the ear of mrs chevenix but the lover's soul languished for a closer communion than this for tete -tay rambles under the forest trees of fulham for a snug little corner on board mr cinqmars barge when she gave her great water parties up the river between hampton lock and hanley for waltzes in the rustic drawing-room where half a dozen couples were wont to have the floor to themselves late in the night after the cinqmars dinners the viscount's chances of meeting his beloved in society were not numerous his circle was not mrs chevenix's circle and it annoyed him to hear of dinners and balls to which elizabeth was going the dinners of wealthy professional men or commercial magnates 
just outside the boundary of his patrician world the rancho offered an open field for their frequent meeting and it was for this reason that the viscount desired to bring about an alliance between elizabeth and mrs cinqmars miss luttrell accepted the lady's enthusiastic welcome with her usual coolness and allowed her aunt to descant alone upon the charms of the rancho grounds and her astonishment at finding so large a domain on the very edge of london lord paulyn had arrived before them and was ready to carry off elizabeth at once to explore the beauties of the place i know you're fond of old trees he said and you must see mrs cinqmars cedars flora cinqmars looked after the two with an air of enlightenment so lord paulyn was sweet upon that handsome devonshire girl people talked so much about the discovery was not an agreeable one mrs cinqmars liked her friends best when their affections were disengaged and no doubt if lord paulyn married there would be an end of an acquaintance which had been very useful to her she was not however an ill-natured person so she gave her graceful shoulders a careless little shrug and resigned herself to the inevitable i suppose i had better be civil to the girl she thought and if he cuts us after he is married i can't help it but perhaps he'll hardly do that if he marries a parson's daughter though he might if he took up with some heavy swell who'd run her pen through the list of his bachelor acquaintances and put her veto on all the nicest people elizabeth found mrs cinqmars afternoon by no means disagreeable there were plenty of pleasant people and well-dressed people a few eccentric toilets for say devertier a good many people with a certain kind of literary or artistic distinction a mere effervescence of the hour perhaps a temporary sparkle which would leave them as flat as yesterday's unfinished bottles of champagne by next season but which for the moment made them worth seeing then there were the grounds pink and white horse chestnuts in their whitsuntide glory and the river running swiftly downward under the westering sun lord paulyn tried his uttermost to keep elizabeth to himself to beguile her into lonely walks where he could pour forth the emotions of his soul which did not express themselves in a particularly poetical manner at the best of times but elizabeth was anxious to see the celebrities and a good many people were anxious to see her as a celebrity in her own peculiar line by reason of her beauty so lord paulyn was thwarted in this desire and was fain to be content with keeping his place at her side whether she sat or walked against all comers i never do seem able to get five minutes quiet talk with you he said at last almost savagely when mrs chevenix had joined them and was talking of going back to town i really cannot imagine what you can have to say that can't quite as well be said in a crowd as in solitude answered elizabeth coldly she gave him these little checks occasionally and not quite forgetting that she was the plighted wife of another man a fact which she had begged her aunt to tell lord paulyn and which she fondly supposed had been imparted to him secure in the idea that the viscount had been made acquainted with her position or at any rate serenely indifferent to that gentleman's feelings she enjoyed her new life and permitted her attentions with a charming carelessness as if he had been of little more account than an affectionate sky terrier 
it was one of the prerogatives of her beauty to be admired and she was worldly wise enough to know that her position in her aunt's circle was wondrously enhanced by lord paulyn's very evident subjugation he had as yet neither committed himself nor alarmed her by any direct avowal she had taken care to keep him so completely at bay as to prevent such a crisis and even in the midst of all these pleasures and excitements in this atmosphere of adulation her heart did yearn for the lover from whom she was parted for the light of those dark steadfast eyes the grasp of that strong hand whose touch thrilled her soul for the sound of that earnest voice whose commonest word was sweeter than all other utterances upon this earth she did think of him yes in the very press and hurry of her new life and still more deeply in every chance moment of repose even to-day under those wide-spreading chestnuts beside the sunlit river how doubly trebly unalterably sweet this life would have been could she but have shared it with him if some good fairy would change the positions of these two men she thought childishly and make malcolm lord paulyn what a happy creature i should be and then she was angry with herself for thinking so base a thought had she not won much more than the world in winning him he knows that i am not good that i am just the very last of women he ought to have chosen and yet he loves me i am proud to think of that i should have hardly valued his love if he had only chosen me because i was good and proper and a suitable person for his wife she argued with herself mrs cinqmars entreated her new friends to stay to dinner there were a great many people going to stay really pleasant people mr burjoyce the fashionable novelist and mr macduff the scotch landscape painter whose ben lomond was one of the pictures of the year and lord paulyn had promised to stay if mrs chevenix and miss luttrell would stay whereby it would be peculiarly cruel of them to depart but mrs chevenix was inflexible she was not going to make herself cheap in society which she felt to be second-rate however cool the champagne cup however soft the sward on which she trod you are very good she said but it is quite impossible we have engagements for this evening lord paulyn hereupon began to talk of the derby i want to get up a party mrs cinqmars he said or you shall get it up if you like as you're a top sawyer at that kind of thing suppose i lend you my drag and you can ask mrs chevenix and miss luttrell and myself and a few other nice people and cinqmars and i will tool the team eh wouldn't that be rather jolly mrs cinqmars opined that it would be charming if dear mrs chevenix would go dear mrs chevenix beheld a prospect of being choked with dust and blinded by a blazing sun or chilled to the marrow by an east wind and was not elated and after all it might be almost wiser to let elizabeth go to the races with this rather fast mrs cinqmars without the restraint of any sterner chaperon it might bring matters to a crisis he can't propose to her if i'm always at her elbow thought the sagacious matron i am hardly equal to the fatigue of a derby day she said but if mrs cinqmars would not think it too much trouble to take care of elizabeth mrs cinqmars protested that she would be charmed with such a charge elizabeth's eyes sparkled 
a race-course was still an unknown pleasure one of the many mysteries of that brilliant world which she desired to know by heart before she bade her long good-bye to it so after a little discussion it was settled that miss luttrell was to go to epsom in the drag with mrs cinqmars but i must see you between this and to-morrow week exclaimed that lady who perceiving in which quarter the wind lay was resolved to make the best of the situation and establish herself in the good graces of the future viscountess i have a carpet dance on friday evening you really must come to me mrs chevenix now pray don't say you are full of engagements for friday night we are to dine in the boltons hesitated mrs chevenix we might possibly drive on here afterwards cried mrs cinqmars of course you could remember you are to be with me on friday lord paulyn i shall certainly come if if miss luttrell comes it's certainly too bad of you to make me feel how little weight my influence has good-bye if you positively won't stay to dinner i must go and say good-bye to those blue and white young ladies yonder and with a sweeping continental curtsey mrs cinqmars flittered away in her befrilled muslin draperies and wonderful cherry-coloured satin petticoat with its organ pipe flutings and flying ebon tresses a figure out of a fashion plate i've told captain calendar to drive the drag home said the viscount i thought perhaps you'd be charitable enough to give me a seat in your brougham mrs chevenix the third seat in mrs chevenix's brougham was entirely at his disposal not a very roomy seat he was carried back to town half smothered in silk and muslin but very well contented with his position nevertheless are you going to some very tremendous set out this evening asked lord paulyn as they drove homewards we're not going out at all only i didn't feel inclined to accept mrs cinqmars invitation so i had recourse to a polite fiction answered mrs chevenix and i am particularly engaged to finish that novel in which you interrupted me so ruthlessly this morning said elizabeth but the novel need not prevent your dining with us this evening if you have no better engagement rejoined mrs chevenix if i have no better engagement as if i could have a better engagement you might have a better dinner at any rate i can only promise you our everyday fare answered the matron secure in the possession of a good cook she had made a mental review of her dinner before hazarding the invitation spring soup a salmon trout an infantine shoulder of lamb a sweetbread a gooseberry tart and a parmesan omelette he would hardly get a better dinner at his club and had doubtless seen many a worse at ashcombe i shall like to come of all things said the viscount and if you'd like to hear patty this evening i'll send my man to mitchell's for a box while we dine he added to elizabeth to that young lady the italian opera house was still a scene of enchantment i cannot hear patty too often she said i should like to carry away the memory of her voice when i turn my back upon the world turn your back upon the world echoed lord paulyn what do you mean by that you're not thinking of going into a convent are you she is thinking of nothing so foolish said mrs chevenix hastily no but the world and i will part company when i go back to devonshire oh but you're not going back in a hurry you must stop for goodwood you know you must stop for goodwood mustn't she mrs chevenix i should certainly like to take her down to brighton for the goodwood week yes and i would have the drag down and drive you backwards and forwards my monday must come to an end before july said elizabeth and then turning to her aunt she said almost sternly 
you know aunt there is a reason for my going back soon i know of no reason but your own whims and follies exclaimed mrs chevenix impatiently and i know that i made all my arrangements for taking you back to devonshire early in the autumn and not before that time elizabeth's smooth young brow darkened a little and she was silent for the rest of the drive but this was not the first indication of a temper of her own with which the damsel had favoured lord Paulyn, and it by no means disenchanted him indeed by a strange perversity he liked her all the better for such evidences of high spirit i shall find out the way to break her in when once she belongs to me he thought coolly the little dinner in eaton place south went off very gaily elizabeth had recovered her serenity and was elated by the idea of a night with patty and mozart she went to the piano and sang some of the airs from don giovanni while they were waiting for dinner her fresh young mezzo-soprano sounding rich and full as the voices of the thrushes and blackbirds in the grounds of the rancho she was full of talk during dinner criticized mrs Sinkmars and the rancho with a little dash of cynicism was eager for information about the probabilities of the derby and ready to accept any bets which lord paulyn proposed to her and she seemed to have forgotten the very existence of such a place as hawley yet after the opera that night there was a little recrimination between the aunt and the niece there had been no time for it before i hope you have enjoyed your day and evening lizzie said mrs chevenix as the girl flung off her cloak and seated herself upon a sofa in her aunt's dressing-room with a weary air i'm sure you have had attention and adulation enough this day to satisfy the most exacting young woman i hardly know what you understand by attention and adulation if i have had anything of the kind it has all been from one person lord paulyn has not allowed me to say half a dozen words to any one but himself and as his ideas are rather limited it has been extremely monotonous i should have supposed lord paulyn's attentions would have been sufficient for any reasonable young woman perhaps if she happened to be disengaged and wished to secure him for a husband not otherwise and that reminds me of something that i wanted to say to you auntie you must remember my asking you to tell lord paulyn of my engagement to mr ford yes i remember something of the kind but you have not told him no elizabeth i have not replied the matron busy taking off the various bracelets in which he was wont to fetter herself as heavily as an apprehended housebreaker and with her eyes bent upon her work there are limits even to my forbearance and that i should introduce you to society to my friends with that wretched engagement stamped upon you labelled as it were like one of the pictures in the academy is something more than i could brook i have not told lord paulyn and i tell you frankly that i shall not waste my breath in announcing to any one an engagement which i do not believe will ever be fulfilled what cried elizabeth starting from her half recumbent attitude and standing tall and straight before the audacious speaker what do you think that i would jilt him that after having pined and hungered for his love i would wantonly fling it away yes i will speak the truth however you may ridicule or despise me i loved him with all my heart and soul for a year before he told me that my love was not all wasted anguish i was breaking my heart when he came to my rescue and translated me from the lowest depths of despondency to a heaven of delight do you think that after i have suffered so much for his sake i would trifle with the treasure i have won please don't stand looking at me like miss bateman in leah said aunt chevenix with an ease of manner which was half assumed 
i think you are the most foolish girl it was ever my misfortune to be connected with and i freely admit that it is hardly safe to speculate upon the conduct of such an irrational being but i will nevertheless venture to prophesy that you will not marry your curate and that you will marry someone a great deal better worth having i will never see lord paulyn again i will go back to hawley to-morrow said elizabeth do just as you please replied mrs chevenix coolly knowing that opposition would only inflame the damsel's pride or at any rate i shall tell lord paulyn of my engagement do my dear but as he has never spoken of his regard for you the information may appear somewhat gratuitous elizabeth stood before her silent lost in thought to turn and fly would be the wisest safest course she felt that her position was a false one dangerous even with some small danger that lord paulyn's attentions commonplace as they might be were attentions she malcolm's plighted wife had no right to receive she knew that all these garish pleasures and dissipations which occupied her mind from morning till night were out of harmony with the life she had chosen the fair calm future which she dreamed of sometimes after falling asleep worn out by the day's frivolous labours but to go back suddenly after it had been arranged that she should remain with her aunt at least a month longer was not easy there would be such wonderment on the part of her sisters so many questions to answer even malcolm himself would be naturally surprised by her impetuosity for in her very last letter she had carefully explained to him the necessity for her visit being extended until the second week in june no it was not easy to return to the shelter of hawley vicarage and on the other hand there was her unsatisfied curiosity about the derby that one particular pleasure of a great race which had been described to her as beyond all other pleasures better to drain the cup to satiety so that there might be no after longings she would take care to give the viscount no encouragement during the remainder of her brief career she would snub him ruthlessly even though he were a being somewhat difficult to snub so she resolved to stay and received her aunt's pacific advances graciously and went to bed and dreamt of the commentatory and the statue that stalked in time to that awful music music which is the very essence of all things spectral bore the face of malcolm ford End of book two chapter two recording by john brandon book two chapter three of strangers and pilgrims this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org Recording by John Brandon. Strangers and Pilgrims by Mary Elizabeth Braden. Book Two, Chapter Three. Bianca's heart was coldly frosted o'er with snows on melting an eternal sheet, but his was red within him like the core of old Vesuvius with perpetual heat. And oft he longed internally to pour his flames and glowing lava at her feet but when his burnings he began to spout she stopped his mouth and put the crater out the derby day was over an exceptionally brilliant derby run under a summer-like sky roads gloriously dusty western breezes blowing the favourite a famous french horse triumphant everybody except perhaps the bookman and sundry other mistaken spectators elated mrs cinqmars seeing her way to a twelve-month supply of piver and jovan elizabeth also a considerable winner of the same species of spoil the viscount was not altogether delighted by the great event of the day he had withdrawn his own entries two or three months ago but had backed a yorkshire horse from whitehall somewhat heavily sceptical as to the merits of the frenchman it's all very well while he's among french horses he had said winning 
your grand prix and that kind of thing but let him come over here and lick a field of genuine english blood and sin you if he can the frenchman had accepted the challenge and had left the pride and glory of many a british stable in the ruck behind his flying heels couldn't have done it if there wasn't english blood in him said the viscount grimly as he pushed his way within the sacred precincts to see the jockey wade i wish i had some money on him instead of the pleasing idea of that potful of money which he might have secured by backing the frenchman lord paulyn had a cargo of gloves to provide for the fair spectators whose eager championship of the stranger he had smiled at somewhat scornfully half an hour ago to say nothing of far heavier losses which only such estates as the paulyn domains could bear easily i shall pull up on ascot he thought and was not too sorry to resign the reins to mr cinqmars during the homeward journey while he abandoned his powerful mind to a close calculation of his chances for the next great meeting he was a man with whom the turf was a serious business a man who went as carefully into all the ins and outs of horse racing as a great financier into the science of the stock exchange and he had hitherto contrived to make his winnings cover all his stable expenses and even at times leave a handsome margin beyond them above all things he hated losing and his meditative brow as he sat beside mr cinqmars bore a family resemblance to the countenance of the astute dowager when she gave herself up to the study of her private ledger even elizabeth's fresh young voice running gaily on just behind him did not arouse him from his moody abstraction he had been all devotion during the drive to epsom and miss luttrell's coldness and incivility which of late had been marked had not been sufficient to repel or discourage him what did he care whether she was civil or uncivil he rather liked those chilling airs and angry flashes from brilliant eyes they gave a charm and piquancy to her society which he had never found in the insipid amiability of other women what did it matter how she flouted him he meant to marry her and she of course meant to marry him it was not to be supposed that any woman in her right mind would refuse such an offer and in the meanwhile these coldnesses and little bitter speeches and disdainful looks were the merest coquetries a benedick and beatrice or catherine and petruchio kind of business see how uncivil that fair shrew was at the outset and how much she bore from her newly wedded master afterwards lord paulyn smiled to himself as he thought of petruchio i've got a trifle of that sort of stuff in me he said to himself complacently what is the matter with lord paulyn asked elizabeth of mrs cinqmars when they were changing horses at mitcham and the viscount's gloom became for the first time obvious to her she had been too busy to notice him until that moment agreeably employed in discussing the day's racing with a couple of cavalry officers particular friends of mr cinqmars who were delighted with the privilege of instructing her in the mysteries of the turf she had a way of being intensely interested in whatever engaged her attention for the moment and was as eager to hear about favourites and jockeys as if she had been the daughter of some yorkshire squire almost cradled in a racing stable and swaddled in a horse-cloth i'm afraid he's been losing money said mrs cinqmars as the viscount descended to inspect his horses and refresh himself with brandy and soda he ought to have back the foreigner he does look rather glum doesn't he does he mind losing a little money exclaimed elizabeth incredulously i don't think there are many people who like it answered mrs cinqmars laughing but he is so enormously rich i should have thought he would hardly care about it i know that lady paulyn his mother is very fond of money but for a young man to care 
i should have thought it impossible very low isn't it said major bolding one of her instructors in the science of racing but rather a common weakness so very human only it's bad form to show it as pollen does it's only rich people who have a genuine affection for money remarked mrs cinqmars a poor man never keeps a sovereign long enough to become attached to it the examination of his team did not tend to improve the viscount's temper they had sustained various infinitesimal injuries in the journey to and from the course so he refreshed himself by swearing a little in a subdued manner at his grooms who had nothing to do with these damages and then consumed his brandy and soda in a sullen silence only replying to mr cinqmars lively remarks by reluctant monosyllables can't you let a fellow alone when you see he's thinking he exclaimed at last i wouldn't think too much if i were you paulin said mr cinqmars in his genial happy-go-lucky manner i don't believe you've the kind of brain that can stand it i've made a point of never thinking since i was five and twenty i go up to the city and do my work in a couple of hours with pen ink and paper all my figures before me in black and white not dancing about my brain from morning till night and from night till morning as some men let them dance when i've settled everything on my desk i give my junior partner his orders and before i've taken my hat off the peg to leave the office i've emptied my brain of all business ideas and perplexities as clean as if i'd taken a broom and swept it all very well while you're making money said the viscount but you couldn't do that if you were losing perhaps not but there are men who can't make money without wearing their brains out with perpetual mental arithmetic men who carry the last two pages of their banking book pasted upon the inside of their heads and are always going over the figures those are the men who go off their nuts by the time they're worth a million or so and cut their throats for fear of dying in a workhouse come i say paulin i know you're savage with yourself for not backing the foreigner but you can put your money on him for the ledger and come home that way very likely when there's five to four on him cried the viscount contemptuously then brightening a little he inquired what was to be the order of things that night at the rancho we've a lot of people coming to dinner at nine or so and i suppose my wife means a dance afterwards like cremorne said lord paulin mind your wife makes miss luttrell stay oh of course we couldn't afford to lose the star of the evening a fine girl isn't she added mr cinqmars glancing critically upwards at the figure in the front seat of the drag a fine girl echoed the viscount contemptuously she's the handsomest woman i ever set my eyes on bar none lord paulin improved considerably after this and when he went back to the box seat took care that major bolding had no further opportunity of demonstrating his familiarity with the arcana of the turf he engaged the whole of elizabeth's attention and was not to be rebuffed by her coldness and took upon himself the manner of an acknowledged lover a manner which was not a little embarrassing to the plighted wife of malcolm ford i must make an end of it as soon as possible she thought i don't know that today's amusement has been worth the penalty i have to pay for it the drag was crossing clapton common an admiring crowd gazing upward at the patrician vehicle as it towered above wagonettes baroques landaus hansoms and costermongers trucks when elizabeth gave a little start of surprise at recognizing a face that belonged to hawley it was only the rubicund visage of a hawley farmer a man who had a family pew at st clement's and who dutifully attended the two services every sunday with an apple-cheeked wife and a brood of children he was one of a very hilarious party in a wagonette a party of stout middle-aged persons of the publican order who were smoking vehemently and had wooden dolls stuck in their hat-bands she saw him look up and recognize her with ineffable surprise and immediately communicate the fact of her presence to his companions 
whereat there was a general upward gaze of admiring eyes more or less bedimmed by dubious champagne what's the matter asked lord paulyn perceiving that slight movement of surprise nothing i saw a person i know in a wagonette only mr treby a farmer who goes to papa's church but i was surprised at seeing him here not very astonishing the derby is a grand festival for provincials and we are such an unenlightened set in the west we have no great races for a yorkshireman now there is nothing to see in the south his own racecourses are as fine as anything we can show him here elizabeth was silent she was thinking how mr treby would go back and tell the little world of hawley how he had seen her perched high up on a gaudy yellow-bodied coach one of two women among a party of a dozen men dominating that noisy dissipated-looking crowd with a pink-lined parasol between her and the low sunlight and she was thinking that the picture would hardly seem a pleasing vision to the eyes of malcolm ford she had meant of course to tell him of her day at epsom but then the same things might seem very different described by herself and by mr treby she tried to take comfort from the thought that after all mr treby might say very little about the encounter and that the little he did say might not happen to reach malcolm's ears malcolm dear name only to breathe it softly to herself was like the utterance of some soothing spell after that glimpse of mr treby's rubicund visage in the wagonette her spirits flagged a little she was glad when the drag passed putney bridge how brightly ran the river under the western sun how gay the steep old-fashioned street with its flags and open windows and noisy taverns and lounging boating men the scene had a garish tawdry look somehow and her head ached to desperation she was very glad when they drove into the cool shades of the rancho oh yes thanks i've had a most delightful day she said in reply to mr cinqmars inquiry as to her enjoyment of the great festival but the noise and the sunshine have given me a headache and i think if you would let me go home at once it would be best for me go home nonsense my dear your aunt is to dine with us and take you back after our little dance it's only half past seven you shall have a cup of green tea then lie down and rest for an hour and you'll be as fresh as a rose by nine o'clock turner take miss luttrell to the blue room and make her comfortable this order was given to a smartly dressed maid who had come to take the ladies cloaks and parasols elizabeth gave a little sigh of resignation if it were possible to grow sick to death of this bright new world all in a moment such a sickness seemed to have come over her but from the maelstrom of pleasure be it only the feeblest provincial whirlpool swift and sudden extrication is for the most part difficult i will stop if you wish she said but my head is really very bad in spite of her headache however miss luttrell appeared at the banquet which was delayed by tardy arrivals till about a quarter to ten brightest amongst the brilliant mrs chevenix was there in her glory on the right hand of mr cinqmars and was fain to confess to herself that the society which these people contrived to get about them was by no means despicable a little fast undoubtedly and with the masculine element predominating somewhat obviously but it was pleasant when venturing out on one's own strictly correct circle to find oneself among so many people with handles to their names lord paulyn had by this time entirely recovered his equanimity and had contrived to take elizabeth into dinner a somewhat noisy feast at which everybody talked of the event of the day as if it were the beginning middle and end of the great scheme of creation 
the wide windows were all open to the spring night hanging moderator lamps shed their subdued light upon a vast oval table which was like a dwarf forest of ferns stephanotis and scarlet geranium it was quite as good as dining out of doors without the inconveniences attendant upon the actual thing a little after eleven o'clock there came a crash of opening chords from a piano cornet and violin artfully hidden in a small room off the drawing-room and then the low entrancing melody of a waltz by strauss the ladies rose at the sound and the greater number of the gentlemen left the dining-room with them we can leave those fellows drinking curacao and squabbling about the odds for the oaks said major bolding we don't want them this was an undeniable fact for the danseuses were much in the minority there was a sprinkling of wives of authors and actors a few dearest friends of mrs cinqmars who seemed to stand more or less alone in the world and to be freelances in the way of flirtation a young lady with long raven ringlets and a sentimental air who was said to be something very great in the musical line but was rarely allowed to exhibit her talents a stout literary widow who founded all her fashionable novels on the society at the rancho and a popular actress who could sometimes be persuaded to gratify her friends with the charge of the six hundred or the famous scene between mr pickwick and the bath magistrate elizabeth found herself assailed by a herd of eager supplicants who entreated for round dances no one ever suggested quadrilles at the rancho nor were these unceremonious assemblies fettered by the iron bondage of a program remember said lord paulyn you've promised me three waltzes if i dance at all but i don't think i shall neither shall i then answered the viscount coolly a daughtres gentlemen miss luttrell doesn't dance to-night i'd rather take a refusal from the lady's own lips if it's all the same to you paulyn said major bolding the dust and heat have given me an excruciating headache and i really do not feel equal to waltzing answered elizabeth shall i get them to play a quadrille no thanks i'm hardly equal to that either and i know mrs cinqmars hates square dances never mind mrs cinqmars half a loaf is better than no bread if you'll dance the first set the lancers anything shall i tell the fellow to play the grand duchesse or la belle helene please don't but if you'll take me for a turn by the river i should be glad will you come auntie i don't suppose these rooms really are hot but in spite of all those open windows i feel almost stifled lord paulyn's countenance was obscured by a scowl at this proposition and mrs chevenix was quick to perceive the cloud what could elizabeth mean by this incorrigible fatuity was it not bad enough to have a country curate in the background without introducing a new element of discord in the person of this dashing major there was no time for careful diplomacy the situation demanded an audacious master-stroke lord paulyn can take care of you lizzie said the matron and i'll ask major bolding to give me his arm for i want to talk to him about my dear friends the clutterbucks relatives of yours are they not major yes tom clutterbucks something in the way of a cousin growled the reluctant major rather sulkily but they're in rome and i haven't heard of them for an age he offered his arm to the aunt instead of the niece with a tolerably resigned air however perceiving that the position was more critical than he had supposed and not wishing to mar miss luttrell's chances so mrs chevenix sailed off through the open window to the lawn 
a ponderous figure in purple satin and old point and elizabeth found herself constrained to accept the escort of the man she so ardently desired to keep at a convenient distance they walked slowly down to the river terrace almost in silence that scene of a moonlit garden by a moonlit river is one of those pictures whose beauty seems for ever fresh from putney to reading what a succession of riverside paradises greets the envious eyes of the traveller and at sight of every new domain he cries oh this is lovelier than all the rest here would i end my days and all mankind's aspirations after a comfortable income and a peaceful existence include a river at my garden's end but it was not the tranquil splendour of the moonlight or the eternal beauty of the river that moved the soul of reginald paulin and held him in unaccustomed silence he was angry some dull sparks at his vexation at having backed the wrong horse yet smouldered in his breast but he was much more angry at the conduct of elizabeth luttrell it was all very well to be snubbed to be trifled with to be played with as a fish that the angler means to land anon with tender care but there had been something too much of this the damsel had said one or two things at dinner that had been intended to enlighten him and had in some measure removed the bandage from his eyes he wanted to know the exact meaning of these speeches he wanted to know without an hour's delay whether she elizabeth luttrell a country parson's penniless daughter were capable of setting him at naught he hardly knew in what words to frame his desire and perhaps at this moment for the first time in his life it dawned upon him that the chosen vocabulary of his own particular set was a somewhat restricted language for a man in his position elizabeth made some remark about the beauty of the scene so much better than any drawing-room and he answered her mechanically and that was all that was said by either until they came to the river terrace by which time mrs chevenix and her companion who had walked briskly were at some distance from them stop a bit miss luttrell said lord paulyn coming to a sudden standstill by the stone balustrade that guarded a flight of steps leading down to the water don't be in such a hurry to overtake those two they'll get on well enough without us i want to talk to you about about something very particular elizabeth's heart sank at this ominous prelude she felt that it was coming that crisis which of late she had done her uttermost to avert i can't imagine what you can have to say to me she said with an airy little laugh and a very fair assumption of carelessness lord paulyn leant back upon the balustrade with his elbow planted on the stone looking up at her with a resolute scrutiny can't you he asked somewhat bitterly and yet i should think it was easy enough for you to guess what i'm going to say to you in plain words to-night i've been saying it in a hundred ways for the last six weeks saying it plain enough for any one to understand i should have thought any one in their senses at least and there doesn't seem room for much doubt about yours i love you elizabeth that's what i have to say and i mean you to be my wife you mean me cried elizabeth with inexpressible scorn and a laugh that stung her lover as sharply as a blow you mean me to be your wife upon my honour lord paulyn you have quite an oriental idea of a woman's position you are to fling your handkerchief to your favourite slave and she is to pick it up and bring it to you with a curtsey you never look so handsome as when you're angry said the viscount undismayed and smiling at her wrath but don't be angry with me i didn't intend to offend you i should have said the same if you had been a princess of the royal blood 
i only tell you what i swore to myself last november the day i first saw your face in holly church that's the woman i'll have for my wife i never yet set my heart upon anything that i didn't win it i know how cleverly you've played me for the last five weeks keeping me on by keeping me off eh but we may as well drop all that sort of thing now elizabeth you are the only woman in this world i'll ever make a viscountess of and of course you've known that all along or you wouldn't have given me the encouragement you have given me in your off-hand way don't try to humbug me i'm a man of the world and i've known from the first that it was a settled thing between you and the old woman i beg your pardon mr chevenix encouragement cried elizabeth aghast i give you encouragement lord paulyn why i've done everything in the world to show you my indifference oh yes i know all about that you've been uncivil enough i grant you and many a man in my position would have been choked off but i'm not that kind of fellow you've given me as much of your society as circumstances allowed that's the grand point and you must have known that every day made me more desperately in love with you you're not going to round upon me and pretend indifference after that it would be rather too bad elizabeth was silent for a brief space conscience-stricken she had deemed this lording of so shallow a nature that it could matter little how she trifled with him he had his grand passion no doubt every season hovered butterfly-like around some particular flower in the fashionable parterre and flew off unscathed when london began to grow empty that she could inflict any wrong upon him by suffering his attentions had never occurred to her she had thought at one time even that it would be rather nice to bring him to her feet and astound him by a cool refusal and even now though she was not a little perplexed by a kind of rough earnestness and intensity in his speech and manner she did not feel a faint thrill of triumph in the idea of his subjugation it would be something to tell gertrude and diana those representatives of her little world who had sneered at the humble end of all her grand ideas there would be not a little satisfaction to her pride in being able to tell them that lord paulyn had actually proposed to her the coronet of the paulyns the airy round and top of sovereignty floated before her vision for a moment as she looked across the moonlit river phantomwise like macbeth's dagger if she had not loved that other one above the sordid splendours of the world what a brilliant fortune might have been hers as reginald was not positively obnoxious to her he was good-looking seemed good-natured had been the veriest slave of her every whim and she had grown accustomed to his society she had no doubt that he would make a very tolerable husband and as the inexhaustible source of carriages horses opera boxes diamonds yachts and riverside villas she must needs have regarded him with a certain grateful fondness had she been free to accept him but she was bound to a man whom she loved to distraction and not to be an empress would she have loosened that dear bondage it's all my aunt's fault she said after that brief pause i begged her she ought to have told you that i'm engaged to be married engaged cried the viscount engaged not since you've come to town why i know almost every fellow that's been hanging around you and they have had precious little chance unless it's someone you've met at those confounded parties on the other side of hyde park i was engaged before i came to london what to some fellow in holly and you let me dance attendance upon you and spend three mornings a week in eaton place and follow you about to every infernal picture gallery till the greens and blues in their confounded landscapes gave me the vertigo and to every tuppenny halfpenny flower show staring at azaleas and rhododendrons and then you turn round and tell me you're engaged by miss luttrell if you mean what you say you're the most brazen-faced flirt it was ever my bad luck to meet with in half a dozen london seasons 
elizabeth drew herself up trembling with anger what did he dare insult her and had she really been guilty conscience was slow to answer that question how dare you talk to me like that she exclaimed i i will never speak to you again as long as i live lord paulyn a woman's favourite threat in moments of extremity and generally the prelude to a torrent of words by the right you've given me every day for the last six weeks by the right which the world has assumed when it couples our names as they are coupled by every one who knows us throw me over if you like but it will be the worse for you if you do for every one will say it was i who jilted you a woman can't carry on as you've carried on and then turn round and say oh i beg your pardon it was all a mistake i'm engaged to somebody else and then suddenly with a still fiercer flash of anger he demanded who is he who is the man the gentleman to whom i have the honour to be engaged is mr ford my father's curate perhaps it would be better for you to make your complaint about my conduct to him egad i should think he'd be rather astonished if i did enlighten him a little on that score your father's curate so it's for the sake of a beggarly curate you're going to throw me over the bridge you are at liberty to insult me lord paulyn but i must insist upon your refraining from any insolent mention of my future husband and now perhaps as we quite understand each other you will be good enough to let me go to my aunt don't be in such a hurry miss luttrell said the viscount white with anger that he reginald paulyn should be rejected by any woman living least of all by a country vicar's daughter and in favour of a country curate it was not to be endured but of course she was not in earnest this pretended refusal was only an elaborate coquetry i'm i'm not a bad-tempered man that i'm aware he went on after struggling with his rising ire but there are some things beyond any man's forbearance and after leading me on as you have done that you can look me in the face and tell me you're going to marry another man i can't believe it of you no not from your own lips come elizabeth be reasonable drop all this nonsense never mind if there has been some kind of flirtation between you and ford let bygones be bygones i won't quarrel with the past but give me a straight answer like a woman of the world remember there's nothing you care for in this world that i can't give you you were made to occupy a brilliant position and i love you better than i ever loved any human creature he took her hand which he did not withdraw from him she let him hold it in his strong grasp a poor little icy cold unresisting hand for the first time it dawned upon her that she had done him a great wrong do you really care for me she asked with a serious wondering air i am so sorry and begin to see that i have done wrong i ought to have been more candid but indeed lord paulyn it is my aunt's fault i begged her to tell you of my engagement i would have told you myself even only with a feeble little laugh <laughs> i could hardly volunteer such a piece of information it would have been so presumptuous to suppose that you were in any danger from our brotherly and sisterly acquaintance brotherly and sisterly be hanged said the viscount you must have known that i doted on you god knows i've let you see it plain enough i've never hid my light under a bushel after this there came another brief silence elizabeth looking thoughtfully at the rippling water lord paulyn watching her face with a gloomy air come he said at last what is it to be are you going to throw me over for the sake of this curate fellow are you going to bury yourself alive in a country parsonage teaching a pack of snivelling children psalm singing you've tasted blood you know something of what life is come lizzie be just to yourself and me 
write this ford fellow a civil letter telling him you've changed your mind not for egypt said elizabeth turning her flashing eyes upon him eyes which a moment before had been gazing dreamily at the river you do not know how i love him yes i love the world too she went on as if answering that sordid plea by which the viscount had endeavoured to sustain his suit i do love the world its pleasures are all so new to me and i have enjoyed my life unspeakably since i've been in london yes in spite of being parted from him but i would no more give him up than i could cut my heart out of my body and live i am quite willing to admit that i have done wrong this with an air of proud humility which was very rare in elizabeth luttrell i beg your pardon lord paulyn i entreat you to forgive me and accept my friendship instead of my love you have been very kind to me very indulgent to all my caprices and tempers and believe me i am not ungrateful forgive you <laughs> he echoed with a harsh laugh be your friend when i had made up my mind to be your husband rather hard lines however i suppose friendship must count for something and as you prefer the notion of psalm singing and three sermons a sunday to a house in mayfair a yacht at cows a racing box at newmarket and stables in yorkshire i should have liked to show you my yorkshire stables and stud farm with a dreamy fondness as you have made your choice i suppose i must abide by it and we'll be friends lizzie i may call you lizzie mayn't i it's only one of the privileges of friendship you may call me anything you like if you'll only promise never to renew this subject and to forgive me for having unwittingly deceived you the viscount clasped her hand in both of his then touched it with his lips for the first time and as he kissed the little white hand with a fond lingering pressure he vowed a vow but whether of friendship and fealty or of passionate treacherous selfish love was a secret hidden in the soul of the viscount himself elizabeth accepted the kiss as a pledge of fidelity and anon began to talk of indifferent subjects with a somewhat forced gaiety as if she would have made believe that there had been no love scene between lord paulyn and herself they left the landing place and strolled slowly on to join the major and aunt chevenix who were both sorely weary of their enforced meanderings the matron smiled upon elizabeth with the smile of triumph she had seen those two motionless figures from afar as she paced the other end of the long terrace with her companion and assured herself that the viscount had come to the point now as they came towards her walking side by side with a friendly air she told herself that all was well elizabeth had renounced the ways of foolishness and had accepted that high fortune which a bounteous destiny had reserved for her i said it when she was still in pinafores thought mrs chevenix that girl was born to be a peeress end of book two chapter three recording by john brandon